two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. <clears throat> we have new mics here, so I was getting used to how it sounds. <laughs> Pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County vis a statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Robin, are there any changes to our agenda for today? Yes, the applicant for 1231 Sixth Avenue North has asked that their application be removed. They are removing the request altogether. And we would ask that the design guideline public hearing be moved to the end of the meeting, if we could. Okay, those are the changes to the agenda. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, any council members here today? We have none. And we will approve the minutes of September 18. I move for approval. Motion. Is there a second? All in favor of the approval? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. All right, we've approved our minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, today on consent we have 1510 Paris Avenue, new construction addition and outbuilding, 1200 Fatherland Street, new, constri new construction addition and setback determination, 2703 Woodlawn Drive, new construction addition, outbuilding and partial demolition, 1909 Shelby Avenue, New construction, addition and setback determination. 105 Broadway, new construction, signage. 2014 White Avenue, new construction, addition, alterations and partial demolition. 2615 Sunset Place, new construction, addition and outbuilding. 2108 11th Avenue South, new construction, addition and outbuilding. 200 Elmington Avenue, new construction, addition and outbuilding and 211 South 13th Street, new construction of an addition. Staff recommends approval of the items on the consent agenda with their applicable conditions, finding they meet the design guidelines of their respective overlays. Questions, Commission? Motion to approve? Oh yeah, oh, if we have any public hearing, anyone here to speak on any of these projects? Okay, close public hearing. I move for approval. Is there a second? second? Okay, there's a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Aye. any opposed? Motion carries. The next case is um, MHCC versus JRC Holdings LLC. And this is um, an agreement with 119 Third Avenue South. Um, they had some via signage violations and they have proposed that they remove almost all of those, keep a projecting sign, and in exchange for having more wall signage than the guidelines allow for, they will not max out their projecting signage, which they've used about half of. Okay, any questions? Unless the board has any specific questions about it, Ms. Um, 
Ziegler has given kind of a summary to you all as to what our proposed settlement, the Department of Law is in full support of the settlement. We think it is a good settlement. Um, if the board would entertain a motion to approve the settlement, then we will enter into an agreed order with opposing counsel concerning it. Any questions to legal? Okay. Is there a motion? Move approval with the agreed order. Okay, there is a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And good work on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will share it with the, the lead attorney on this case, Kwan Poo. Thank yes, you very thank much. Thank you. All right, commissioners, the first item of new business today is an application for uh, partial demolition uh, to remove an original chimney at 2535 Ashwood Avenue. Uh, the chimney, as you see there on the left side of the building, has been identified as being the source of water leaking into the building. Uh, a contractor with expertise in chimney repair evaluated the chimney and determined that the mortar, uh, it's obviously a masonry chim chimney, the mortar and was failing and many of the bricks were cracked or broken. Uh, the contractor recommended that the chimney be removed or reconstructed. Uh, and the applicant proposes to demolish the chimney, uh, to remove the chimney down to below the roof line and then patch the hole in the roof. Um, the commission has allowed chimneys on the rear of buildings to be removed, but never a chimney on the front or side of an historic house. Uh, chimney removal impacts the form and silhouette of a house, as you would see it from the right of way. Um, chimneys may often be very utilitarian, and even then they've been required to be preserved. Um, this one, however, appears to have been designed with intent and care given to its appearance. Uh, it's uh, essentially a part of the, uh, the design of the house, uh, the intent of the, the house. Um, it projects from the, the main wall it, rather than being embedded or interior to the structure. Um, it, uh, the structure or the brick uh, matches the, the remainder of the brick on the house. Uh, there's a soldier course of brick along the water table line and that's carried across the foundation. And the brickwork of the chimney is stepped, reducing the width as it crosses across, uh, along the wall of the upper story and up and through the roof, um, uh, penetrating the roof above. Um, the deteriorated condition of the chimney is certainly unfortunate, but, but not uncommon. Uh, and removing an original feature, particularly one that would be found on similar houses uh, or similar on thousands of houses in this and other districts uh, is not appropriate. Staff recommends disapproval of the application to demolish the original chimney on the house at 2535 Ashwood Avenue, finding that doing so would be an inappropriate demolition under section 3B1 of the design guidelines for the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Uh, if repair is not possible, reconstruction with brick matching the original would be an appropriate uh, Alter alternative and would be administratively approved, uh, but using another brick or another material like cement fiber, stone, or a brick that doesn't match would not be appropriate. Thank you, Sean. Any questions at the moment? Okay. Applicant, are you here? Thank you. Hi, I'm Erica Reed. I'm the owner of 2535 Ashwood Avenue. As Mr. Alexander points out, the brick of my home is extremely unique. And to find brick that even will remotely come to matching it will be extremely challenging, if not impossible. The shape, the color is extremely unique. I've only seen one home in my neighborhood that even has this kind of brick. The cost to rebuild it just for aesthetic purposes, not for any functional use, is double the cost to tear it down and just roof over it. My desire is just to 
fix the leak and prevent any further damage from happening to the home. And I think it's extremely unreasonable to require me to spend double the cost. I think that is causing an economic, ec economic hardship to me to pay double for something that won't even have a functioning use. So what is your request? Just, Just to verbal. take the chimney down to the roof line and patch over it and seal it so that there will be no more water coming into my home through the chimney. So the chimney goes away? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? We might have some later. <laughs> okay, open public hearing. Anyone here to speak on this project? We will close public hearing. Discussions, commissioners. I do have a question for the owner. Um, what, have you consulted? Can you come back up, please? Thank you. Yeah. What steps have you taken to consult with, like a historic tuck pointer or something of that nature to try to re remediate the leak that's coming through the roof? I've dealt with two chimney companies. The first chimney company that I've been dealing with, I think should have caught this earlier until it became an issue. They didn't, so I obviously don't have any faith in them. And the second chimney company is the one who has recommended bringing it down to the roof line or rebuilding it, but did point out that rebuilding it, it's not going to look the same as the rest of the house because it will be very difficult to find brick that will look similar. Yeah. So you haven't found anybody that would recommend a repair of the chimney or that could be? Okay, thanks. Thank you. I have an additional question before you sit down. So in, in looking at a previous photograph, I, it's unclear the current condition of it with a bag around it. Yeah, um, that's an old picture. That tree is a lot bigger and pretty much covers the, sure. the chimney from the front. In in there, the chimney company's evaluation of it, mm -hmm. was it is it leaking from... They don't know where the source is, or it's leaking on all sides? Or I think it's leaking on all sides. The bricks are cracked, the mortar is cracked. There are cracks <clears throat> where the ceiling is. The f and the, the flashing I mean, it's, it's, it's caused, yeah, I mean, I, you can see it's caused water damage on the plaster on the inside of my home, which also sure. I'm going to need to fix. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, it seems, just by the nature of that brick, I, I don't doubt that it would be difficult to find an exact match. Um, and But I, I'm, I'm curious, I asked the question because I'm curious how much of the brick, certainly one way to do it is just sort of lop it off and <clears throat> rebuild it. Mm -hmm. um, not on a historic home necessarily would I recommend that, and, and I think your material cost might be a little, little less labor cost to take it down brick by brick and put it back up. Obviously would would be more than just to, you know, lop it off and, and start anew. Um, so I, I asked that question is how much of the, truly how much of the brick is gone? Sal salvageable. Yeah. Uh, according to Chim Chimney, which is the chimney company that I've talked to, mm -hmm. they think about half the brick is not salvageable. And to have to try and salvage the brick, I think would obviously increase the labor costs of them even trying to be able to salvage any of it. Understood. The only thing I'd add to that is uh, I actually had this same issue with my chimney on my last house, and it ended up um, kind of where um, Commissioner Mayhall was going, that um, they tuck pointed it, and, and was, some repairs were done for it. Uh, it was a 1930s home, so it, or late 20s, so it was similar. So I don't, I don't know if um, Chim Chimney, uh, I wonder if uh, someone else looking at it more of a masonry um, and getting into probably past where we probably at this point in discussion, but that's where I wondered about what a masonry person looked at mine and they did some tuck pointing and it was never, that one didn't leak again. Had some other leaks, but not that one again. So maybe it's, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe another. Um, I, don't know what another tuck, uh, I don't know what tuck pointing is, but if that's, you know, kind of just filling in gaps, I was told that that really wasn't a possibility because of all the cracks in the bricks. It, it might be good to talk to a masonry um, restorationist. Anyone? Anyway. This Just was give my a second or opinion. third opinion. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's my question as well: Is that if you do cap off 
and you roof that part, which is what we're hearing you say. What happens to the rest of the chimney? You know, it remains. Sorry? It, the side part, mm -hmm. I would just leave it alone. But it also has the same condition. So water will still come in Mine. those, those yeah. walls, correct? No one has mentioned anything to me about cracks on the side. It's all on the top. Well, perhaps that is true about having a masonry uh, professional really look at that instead of just a chimney, not discounting the chimney, chim chimney, but um, structurals like that are can usually be affected as well. You know, the rest of it, you may have to start to get issues there too. I mean, I had a foundation person come last year to check out the whole house, and even they didn't mention anything was wrong with the home, and that was a year ago. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in looking at this, one of the things I noticed was that there was no cricket on this chimney, and that creates a situation. The flashing seemed to be pretty well done, but, but it's hard to tell whether water coming down that roof that goes right against that chimney might be part of the source of this. But so, so I think, you know, the, the chimney is an important part of the house. Uh, I think, you know, for future owners, they may well want that chimney and operable fireplace in that house. It's an important part of it. Uh, so to make this an actual operable fireplace would cost ten thousand five hundred dollars. Okay. Which, which some people may do. I mean, it's it, it depends on what your what your priorities are and what you want. So, but but I think it is an important part of the house. So I would think having. A, a historic mason look at this because I have seen chimneys in much worse shape than this that were just tuck pointed with appropriate mortar uh, that could come back. Um, so. Ms. Reed, let us uh, let the commission. Thank you for coming up. We might ask another question. Thank you. I agree with you, um, Cyril. Uh, I've seen chimneys in, in worse condition. I think this is the type of situation where a specialist is needed in historic mortar, um, mortar and, and masonry construction. I'm seeing huge gaps in the flashing at the roof level. Uh, I don't really see much deterioration in the bricks themselves. I think that's kind of, it's an odd brick type that seems to sort of be distra have a distressed look intentionally. I, I don't know that these are, I don't think that these are failing bricks or a failing chimney. I think it just needs some routine maintenance that a specialist could provide. Sean, do you think that you could direct um, the applicant to a, a person who specializes in historic tuck pointing to get another opinion? I would definitely be willing to work with them and, and provide any suggestions or uh, okay. assistance that uh, of the resources our office has to provide. Okay, I, ju I, just, I just would feel better if we had a, an expert in that. Give and their I, opinion. Yeah, and I would think in addition to the mason would be a roofer as well because, uh, you know, flashing and that kind of thing would really be more the purview of a roofer. So. Okay. Can um, someone make a motion, please? I'd, I'd like to, I guess, to add to in the staff's recommendation or staff's evaluation of this that, that it is, um, I'm in agreement that it is a character defining element, not at the rear of the house or I mean, it's, it's on the primary elevation to take it, to put it in, in a different context. If, if there were a window that were specialized that were completely deteriorated and it were a character defining feature of the house to, to block over that window, we're asking a similar thing, I think, to happen here. It's not exactly the same, but it's certainly similar in terms of what are character-defining elements of of, uh, of a historic asset and being in a um, in a district with rules and guidelines. It it, um, it seems in contradiction, direct contradiction to those to allow a chimney to be uh, chimney to be lopped at the roof and and roofed over. So in that case, I would. Um, move for disapproval of the application for demolition of the chimney down to the roof line. 
Motion. Motion. Second? Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. None opposed. The motion passes. Okay. 3921, keep along. Thirty nine twenty one Kimpalong is an application for a detached accessory dwelling unit at the rear of this lot. The applicant is requesting a setback determination for the side uh, setback from five feet to three feet. This existing outbuilding will be removed for the new structure. This demolition is appropriate, meets the design guidelines for appropriate demolition. Here are the elevations. The uh, proposed outbuilding has a footprint right at 1,000 square feet, uh, which is allowed for a lot this size. The height is 25 feet, uh, eave height 10 feet. It meets the guidelines for massing, roof form, design, and materials. Uh, it's located at the rear of the lot here, accessed from a driveway which is existing. There's no alley access here. There's a 10-foot um, easement for power lines across the rear property line here. Um, so the, it's being built 10 feet from the rear property line, uh, and the applicant is requesting the uh, setback determination um, to, uh, to kind of scoot it over uh, upwards uh, as you're looking at the page there. Um, structures greater than 700 square feet, uh, code requires a side setback of five feet, as the commission has decided in the past to uh, maintain base zoning requirements, staff recommends that the side setback is kept at five feet. Staff recommends approval of the proposed DADU with the conditions that the setback is increased to five feet, uh, and then staff approval of materials. With those conditions, the project will meet section 2B of the design guidelines for the Woodlawn West District. Questions? Okay. Applicant, please come forward. Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Lamarino with Allard Ward Architects, uh, here on behalf of the homeowners who couldn't be here. Um, we are very accustomed to setting these dados in five and five from the back and front. Um, in this particular situation, um, we're forced forward further on the lot because of that 10 foot rear easement by NES, uh, which pushes it closer to the house. And because the house is situated a little more towards uh, the western side, the driveway side, it creates some really peculiar geometry in terms of pulling in the front. It's a front loaded garage. Um, so uh, the existing garage is nine and three quarters of an inch from the property line now. So we're hoping that we could get a little closer maybe to three feet from the property line um, uh, just so it helped the geometry of getting out of the garage. If we had didn't have that NES easement in the back, we could have pushed the garage further back like we would have, have accustomed to have done, you know, uh, on any other lot. Um, and it would have made it easier to pull in and out of the garage. But uh, because of that, that 10 foot push, uh, the, the two feet reduction on the side would really help the homeowners get in and out a little easier and negotiate around the historic corner of the building there. Any questions to the applicant? Is, is the garage entrance at the bottom it is, drawing? as this is oriented, it's on the right side of, of this drawing that I'm looking at. If you're looking at the same slide, that's the driveway there. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Are there rules or guidelines that you follow as an architect to decide how much room a car needs to, I mean, how do you quantify what's... Well, we do. Um, we're usually looking for... Um, we like to have 24 feet as a backup because that's what you'd see at uh, any kind of two-way backing up, whether you're at Walmart or this parking lot out here in front of Howard School. Um, so we try to use 24. Sometimes we use 20 feet to back out as long as a bumper can maybe go over a planter or something. Uh, so we're 20 feet from the uh, screen porch there. Um, and even with that, 
because they have to back down the driveway, they really do have to maneuver from what looks like the, the lowest parking spot on the drawing here. They have to back up and maneuver missing the house. So that extra couple feet really helps them get out in that situation, especially when you have two separate garage doors and you really can't cut the car quickly with single garage doors as opposed to one bigger one. Um, and that's one of the guidelines for this neighborhood is two separate garage doors because it is front facing. I might ask you some questions in later, but sure. thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Um, public hearing. We will close public hearing. Okay. I'd make an argument. Um, I didn't realize that we did mandate two separate garages. Uh, architecturally, I'm certainly <laughs> much more in favor of that in, in all of our districts, but I know it's not a requirement necessarily. And I think in the applicant's favor that you have a front facing, not only a front facing garage, but it is visible you know, from the side of the house, it's offset so it can be seen. And the two separate garages make that, uh, garage doors make, just make the proportions and, and the architecture of it um, much more fitting to what you would historically see. And so, you know, for that reason, I'm compelled, you know, if you were to combine it to one, maybe you could make that turn a little bit easier, but I am compelled by the applicant's argument that something less than five might be appropriate here. You know, when I reviewed the staff recommendations before the meeting, I, I looked at it and I said, gosh, I don't see any compelling reason for granting the, the satellite variance, but I think the, the architect, the applicant has, has made a pretty compelling reason uh, that I can see, um, see the benefit of. And I'd add to that I, that I agree, and with the NES easement is, is an, a unique situation um, that factors into this as well. With that, with respect to 3921 Kipalong Avenue, um, I move for approval uh, accepting uh, the uh, granting of the sideline variance. With the given? To three feet. With the given. Okay. As presented. Um, second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? None. So the motion carries. Thank you. Madam Chair, on the last case, just. It increases from three to more as, as it's not oriented parallel to the, additionally to the property line, so it's, it's not um, three the whole way back, just that's pretty obvious from looking at the drawings, but it's not just three and then oriented. It, it increases to awfully close to five once you get up near the uh, front of the garage. Duly noted. Okay, uh, this is uh, a complicated application, so please interrupt me, ask me to go back or repeat anything. Um, uh, but I'm still gonna go kind of quick through it or, or because it's been gone over in, in greater detail, or at least just unless you have any questions, uh, it's been reviewed in great detail in the written recommendation. So this will just kind of be a, a summary of it. Uh, it is an application to construct a mixed-use development comprising townhouses and commercial space. Um, it's at the, the shown here, the, the address is, uh, it has two addresses, 1012 Main Street and 1000 Forest Avenue, and that's along Main Street right where it bends and turns into Gallatin Avenue. Um, <clears throat> so it's across from, uh, I guess, uh, the Across Forest Avenue is the back side of the Carnegie Library in East Nashville. Across uh, Gallatin or Main Street is East Nashville High School. Um, it's near uh, the Five Points area for those that, that know um, that part of town. Um, as I said, it is uh, it has two addresses because it has frontage along two streets, along Main Street and uh, some along Forest Avenue as well. Um, and as I said, it's a townhouse development. Uh, here are renderings, or is a rendering, of the street front elevation, uh, and a, as close as I could get to showing the, uh, the same view as it is now uh, from across Main Street. 
these townhouses uh, will be three, two stories along the street front elevations uh, following grade, it drops down from the northeast to southwest. The front wall height of these buildings, of the townhouse portions, is 26 foot, 26 feet, six inches. Uh, and there's a third story component that stepped back 10 feet. Uh, the maximum height of that third story wall is 37 feet. Uh, the guidelines for this part of five points are pretty specific in that they allow one or two stories to be uh, 20, be between 20 and 30 feet tall and to have a third story that adds up to 15 feet. So uh, the form and heights of the proposed building does meet those guidelines. Um, so again, that's sort of just a, a nutshell. I will get a, in a little bit more detail as we look uh, through at the individual ele elevations. Uh, but I want to make uh, point out um, that it, that actually does include three separate structures, uh, and that's just the, showing the footprint. In part, uh, that is because the property is on is currently two lots, and uh, as I understand, the the applicant is not able to combine them. So it's treated as one development, but it will remain two lots. Um, I mentioned the um, street facing elevations that there are two street facing elevations, so I'll show those. Here's uh, the main street elevation and the corresponding floor plans. Um, as I said, uh, 26 feet, six inches tall, um, with the third story rising to uh, 37 feet. Uh, the primary exterior materials here are brick and cement fiber panels. Uh, these are appropriate materials. The brick is propo proposed to be painted white and blue. Uh, the brick sec selection needs to be approved by staff, and staff recommends that the color and texture of the brick be red, the color be red, and that it be compatible texture with historic brick. Um, the proportion and rhythm of windows and is generally appropriate across the uh, residential and the commercial components of the structure on the Main Street elevation. Uh, the commercial component on the left side there, uh, as you see, has a, uh, it's labeled has a glass railing above the top of the parapet wall. That's a um, two-story commercial component that drops down to one story and then the railing is above that. Um, there is not a historic precedent for glass uh, as a front wall uh, or as a parapet wall, essentially, other than for windows. Uh, so continuing the brick would be a more typical of the material and of the commercial uh, forms in the Five Points area and would result in an appropriate wall height there. Uh, so staff recommends that the glass railings be replaced with brick. Uh, so there's the Forest Avenue elevation that faces the back of the library. Um, the elevations there are uh, similar, uh, the same essential townhouse form, uh, although this is a flatter elevation. Main Street is the one that drops down. Um, here, the proposal, uh, same materials, window proportions for the residential component. Uh, the commercial component on the Forest Avenue facade, uh, which is the right, towards the right side of this elevation. Uh, the proposal shows a windowless wall, a portion of windowless wall that would be painted with a mural. Um, murals are nice, but they're not permanent and historic zoning does not review them. They're not covered by the guidelines. Uh, we review architecture and the permanent structure and the guidelines require glazing on the, um, to turn the corner on the secondary street um, and to have a compatible proportion and window, uh, proportion and rhythm of openings. The guidelines actually call for uh, window glazing on the first story to turn and continue 20 feet along a secondary elevation. Uh, so staff recommends, so recommends windows be added on both first and second story of uh, that section of the Forest Avenue facade. Um, so here I'll show the rear elevations of that building and then an elevation of that, the courtyard structure. Um, metal, metal siding is proposed for the rear 
of the street fronting building and on the elevations of the courtyard building. Uh, the guidelines say that metal siding is not permitted, uh, but because it's being used on a non-street facing facade, staff finds that it wouldn't have the same negative effect or the same effect uh, that the street front elevations would. Uh, so staff finds it to be appropriate used on these secondary elevations. Uh, the window and door proportions and rhythm are pretty similar on this courtyard building as well. Uh, and then here's the other two elevations of the courtyard building. I'll show a couple renderings. Uh, that's um, just a little bit sort of streetscape of uh, the main and Forest Avenue elevations. And then that's, again, that uh, panorama of the entire structure uh, or structures. Staff recommends approval of the proposed infill development at 1012 Main Street and 1000 Forest Avenue with the following conditions. That the parapet in the corner of the cor corner commercial component shall be brick instead of glass. That the masonry sec selections shall be red and shall be approved by staff. Uh, that the window and door selections are administratively approved and that windows or doors or both shall be added on the Forest Avenue facade of the corner commercial component on the first and second stories. And I can actually put that all on the screen. In meeting those conditions, staff finds that the proposal meets the design guidelines for new constructions in the Five Points area, I was supposed to say, of the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Sean. Yes. On your recommendation number five, can you show that on, on the elevation? So on the rendering, it's the colorful mural on the bottom right there. They uh, have labeled that on the elevation drawings as mural wall. Uh, and on the Forest Avenue elevation, I've highlighted it there. Um, I'll go back to the floor plan. So, oops. Um, the two street front facades have townhouses going along Main Street and Forest, but at the corner is a, cor a commercial um, component, uh, as I understand it, it's likely to be a restaurant. Uh, and on the roughly 19, 20 foot span of wall of the commercial building that faces Forest uh, is planned to have or designed without any windows. It's just a, a brick wall. Um, we review brick, we review windows, but we don't review paint. So we have no way of, you know, we wouldn't review what something like that would look like, uh, but we do review the building and our guidelines call for appropriate rhythm proportion of windows. So that's why we recommend that there be windows there. The five points design guidelines for the MDHA district, which are we, you know, that's a different organization than us. Obviously, we don't directly follow their guidelines, but uh, their guidelines also call for there to be glazing uh, on corner components of, or on secondary streets of corner buildings. It's interesting, the interjection of mural on this project. Um, since recommendation is to do red brick, red brick color. It's not necessarily painted, it's red brick color, correct? Then if there isn't, uh, the guidelines don't cover murals, how, how do we, um, how, do, how does this balance out technically? Just as you imagine, we review the color, the inherent color of the brick, so, and texture. Um, and. It, perhaps things like the, the size of the brick or, or something like that. We don't often review the coursing detail, but uh, so we review the brick as it's built. And then um, this is a conservation zoning overlay. So whereas a preservation district, we have stricter guidelines about the color of paint, at least for masonry, we do not review, would not review the painting once the building is done. Sean, on, on the pallet of brick, um, it's pretty evident in the elevations that the uh, applicant wants to brick it and then paint it. Uh, at least that's what's called out. Is 
red is generally viewed as much as more appropriate in um, all of our districts. I would admit. I don't think I'm stretching to say that. Primarily, yeah. there are a few other in, occasional. In the, yeah, in that this is a more contemporary form. Is there a broader range of um, brick color that might be appropriate than be beyond red here? I, I'm certainly not suggesting that painting is a good option or the, the premium that you pay, even if you buy the cheapest of bricks and you pay a premium to prep it and paint it, oftentimes is uh, in, in pricing projects, those that just doesn't, the math doesn't doesn't distinguish from you know getting a, a full body colored brick. Th those things generally add up pretty close to the same separate sub. You mobilize your painting. And a lot of those things happen. So I'm wondering if um, if something other than red might be the, the question. There is if something other than red might be appropriate for a more contemporary form so outside of the what would be considered red from orange to maybe a darker red. Um, we have approved some lighter brick on contemporary infill, and we've approved some darker brick, um, sort of a charcoal or gray mm -hmm. in a few places. Um, the, there's an applicant here, and maybe they sure. can address this, but I, my conversations with one of the architects was they were pretty okay with that condition they 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 wanted the building to be blue and white but they didn't necessarily intend to use blue and white brick to begin with sure so maintenance and cost of painting aside I'd, I'll leave that for them to okay. to answer okay for now applicant um, as they come up I'll remind you that there was uh, a letter sent by the council member and I passed yeah. that around before the meeting yes. as well duly noted. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Powell, Powell Architecture Building Studio. I'm actually standing in for Manly Seal, who's our director of architecture, who's actually the uh, design architect for this project. He is out of the country today. So, but um, from what I uh, have been updated by Manly uh, with the conflict between required to do red brick, which uh, I understand the client is um, ready to do red brick, uh, and then we are allowed to paint that brick. Uh, and that's just the cost involved to get a design that the client and us would like to do. So there's really no conflict uh, presented, and uh, we're in agreement with the staff recommendation of red brick. We're in agreement with the staff recommendation to brick up the glass um, uh, railing area, too. No problem there. I, I just want to uh, read aloud, I know just for a second, one paragraph of the letter from uh, Councilman Withers this morning at 8.39. Uh, I'll mention first uh, that Councilman Withers says thanks for the meeting with Parker Brown, Nathan Oliver from the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association, and he mentions a number of other people that we have met with all the local representatives and stakeholders regarding the mural wall on the corner. And Councilman Withers says, for condition number five, the mural wall, I want to offer my support to the applicant's proposal to maintain a solid surface along the forest ave frontage of the corner of the commercial mixed use unit as long as there will be a mural or other piece of public art presented on the facade. Murals have become a character defining feature of East Nashville and many of the other urban neighborhoods revitalization efforts re recently and I am willing to support the applicant's desire to forego glazing on that corner surface provided that a mural or other art piece is installed there in lieu of windows or doors. I would recommend the applicants work with the Chamber East organization, which has been successfully coordinating mural projects on commercial buildings in East Nashville for several years now, matching up businesses and local artists for funded mural projects, which the client would fund the mural project there. Uh, Relooking just for a moment at the site plan, it is a 
wonderfully prominent corner that would be um, really seen by everyone coming south on Main Street just as you hit that corner. So it's going to be a, a great location for a piece of public art or mural. And that's why uh, the, the local stakeholders and the councilmen support having a mural in that location. Can you still add the windows? <laughs> if we paint over the windows. Oh. <laughs> Um, but uh, so we're, uh, we did go through the extensive process with the, with the neighborhood associations, the local chamber, and the councilmen. And at this time, all those stakeholders and the councilmen support the mural. Okay, thank you. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Sean, can you clarify? I, I think I understand this. I just want to make sure I'm crystal on it. Um, we say red brick. It's built with red brick and it's painted, and the applicant can have at it. Is that that's, that's within within their purview, and and that's likely what's going to happen here. Um, for, depending on your point of view, that is one, either one of the fortunate or unfortunate facts about a conservation zoning overlay is something like that's not reviewed. Sure. And so we could say, you know, magenta brick, and it wouldn't really matter. It would just cost them more to put the brick up, probably. There's more red bricks in there than magenta bricks. There is a reason that we review the brick. Um, sure. Of course, we've had, believe it or not, a case where uh, I could not recall the address, but where somebody was going to paint it one color and ended up not doing that. And then, you know, so we need to know the inherent, inherent color of the brick on the... Uh, in the case that it's either not painted or, you know, if the building's going to be there for 50 or 60 years, even if it's blue and white next year, um, that could fade over time. So, you know, we have to look at, at what's sure. permanent about it, uh, and that might be the color of the brick, so that's why we have to review that. No, no further argument from me. I, I just want to make sure I know what we were proven and knew what we may or may not get. It, it doesn't make sense for us to hem and haul over the shade of brick color uh, in this case. I don't think other than if it's red, we know that it would be red if it weren't painted or if it faded. Thank you. Could, could you go back to the slide that shows the floor plan of the first floor? So if, if I'm reading that right, in the retail area, virtually the entire uh, Main Street elevation is glass on that. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I want to um, in looking at the floor plan and I think thinking of the project as an assemblage of its parts, um, you know, 20 feet of masonry is from Commissioner Boyd to me. I mean, in terms of wall area, it is three, two stories tall. Um, just in, in perspective, that's, to keep it in perspective, that's what this comment is about. And, and I don't for a second disagree with the intent of the guidelines, but um, I'm, I personally am drawing a distinction between uh, having unbroken facades of glazing or of just uninterrupted facade of, of, of masonry or any other material that has no articulation to it. It's, it's typically not seen that there are conditions, even in corner buildings, where there's limited openings. Um, and I, th I think in this case, uh, the way I see that retail is because, I mean, literally at its dimension on the drawings at 19 feet and some change, um, you get a step back in the elevation and there's the continued language that is on the other side of the retail along Main Street of a tremendous amount of articulation of, of the facade. And uh, my, when I look at the elevations, you think of it in the third dimension, this is almost like a, it's a visual break of, if you just add much more stuff there, it's just, the all over pattern of things all the way around the building. And I don't, mural or not mural, um, I don't find that an egregious um, violation of, of the guidelines in this particular instance, in this particular, you know, assemblage of the pieces and the parts that the applicant has, um, has shown. Sean, do you mind going to the elevation that um, Ben was referring to just so we can kind of see that? Um without the mural if possible. Yeah, that's good. Oops. 
so yeah, that's uh, the section that's on Forest Avenue. You do see the storefront, but it's it's a, it would be at a different angle because it's actually kind of around the corner, uh, peeking out on the right side. So it is that um, 19, four and a half. Yeah, it's kind of interesting I, when you said it that way, composition-wise, I, I kind of like this better too, but, but um, I hadn't thought of it this way. I, I'm, I'm not arguing that the windows wouldn't be openings and that, that it, uh, yeah. it wouldn't work if you add, that it would be detrimental if you add the windows. I, I, I personally don't, given the orientation and that, you know, a vehicle traveling down the street sort of sees this pylon of calm, visual calm against the rest of the building, yeah. to me is, is unlike another situation where you had a building that all of it was flush and turned the corner and, and, and was a, an, a, di a different assembly of, of things. At the end. And again, I'm not, this, that's just the way I see it. Especially because it's right there. Yeah. And there, it, it's not like they're, like the applicant is trying to, you know, put the least amount of glazing on here to get by in the guidelines. It, it feels to me that there's... Um, there's certainly an attempt to create a cohesive building that wraps the corner in um, in, a, in a way that has a definite rhythm of openings, solid to void. Um, and I'll, I'll, I won't advocate any further. I think it's, everybody knows where I stand. I was just gonna add that, um, I guess sometimes when we see like a large expanse of brick without openings, you know, you worry about the space not being activated and the um, elevations all around this building on each facade are, are very activated. Um, and I would be in support of allowing that section of brick and, and definitely in support of public art. So I'm uh, in favor of allowing that. I would ask, um, because there's some, well, I, this, this is up for debate. There's some capitulation on the part of the staff's recommendation, which in turn would mean the same for um, the commission. And we're, we're free to act and, and see things as we see them. If we were to refer, and, and perhaps um, maybe we should wait till Ms. Jones returns, but if we were to, could we put the condition, and if so, how do we put a condition on something? I wouldn't put, want to put the staff in the position to review art. It's not what we do, and, and but can we refer the applicant to what it sounds like they're inclined to do? Um, they can speak for themselves, but can we refer them to, as the council member, I think has, aside from this was a judicial board arranged with the applicant and, and refer them to that so that somehow a letter or something would come back to the staff and it would be, you know, part of issuing the, the it would just be a box that we would check that this is done, we can now move forward or it's complete or something along those lines. Well, as Commissioner Alex, uh, Commissioner, as staff member uh, Mr. Alexander said, you don't have the authority to review the painting of brick in this district. So it couldn't be part of your condition that it be a mural. So I think that um, your motion would need to be, you'd need to be okay with it being a blank wall because there's no way for us to require it be a mural, that it be retained as a mural, that it be replaced if at some point it's removed. There's no way for us to That's ensure that. completely separate deal with the council member in previous meetings exactly. in, in that case. So, okay, thank you for clarifying. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, based on that, with respect to 1012 Main Street uh, and 1004 Forest Avenue, I move for approval uh, based on the staff recommendations with the exception of recommendation number five regarding windows and doors on the Forest Avenue side of the commercial. There's a motion. Is there a second? second? There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. The pa it passes. Thank you.
4709 <clears throat> Elkins Avenue. This is an application for demolition by argument of economic hardship. The, uh, the building you see here dates to 1914. It was originally a single family home until at least 1968. After that time, it was converted to a, uh, a triplex with the um, visible roof addition added sometime after that. The applicant tells us that it's been unoccupied since 2004, I believe. The Department of Codes and Building Safety contacted the owner earlier this year about several property standards violations, noting that gutters, exterior wood surfaces, and the roof system were required to be corrected. Uh, staff first went out to this building in August and then again in September after the owner had removed um, a significant amount of uh, personal property to accommodate the inspection. There's the building in 1968 and currently uh, two existing outbuildings and a sort of tent in between are also proposed to be removed. Uh, that demolition meets the guidelines for appropriate demolition. The engineer's report on the structure notes that the structural systems suffer from poor and or inadequate design and construction. The load-bearing systems have been damaged by water intrusion and termites. There is crushing and twisting of most of the beams and joists below and rotting of, uh, we estimated, at least 50% uh, of the structure. The engineer concludes that the, quote, stability of the home has been severely affected given the disrepair of the major structural supports. It is questionable if the home could be safely and economically saved. Uh, staff went out to the building twice. Our inspections confirmed the engineer's observations on the structure. Uh, it's staff's review that the building has suffered from deferred maintenance and also uh, poor construction of the, of the structure uh, to begin with. The roof addition has also been a major factor uh, in the, um, the damage to the building. Staff researched nearby comps and estimated a fair market value of $470,951 for the home once uh, rehabilitated. The applicant acquired three bids for repair and rehab of the structure ranging from $475,000 to uh, upwards of uh, five hundred. dollars uh, we adjusted these estimates for items that would not be considered for the scope of this review as we normally do and compared the expenditures to the fair market value, which you see here. Uh, the range of expenditures represents a loss um, all along that range. So along with the condition of the building and um, this valuation, uh, staff finds that the proposed demolition um, meets Section 3B2 for appropriate demolition in the Park and Elkins Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay, and staff recommends approval of the proposed demolition. Also in your report, you had listed that um, a nonprofit was willing to assist in the rehabilitation, and uh, cost was, again, the issue. That's correct. Okay. Paul. Um, would you um, review what replaces this, or has there been a proposal of what rep might replace this? There has not yet been um, uh, anything submitted on that, but we, we would, you would. Okay. I will add, if, if I could, I'm so sorry. Um, the nonprofit was not involved, not because of cost, as much as it was the amount and, and length of repairs, <laughs> or the type of repairs were beyond their capability. It, it was more than just some easy maintenance stuff. Okay, duly noted. I, I, I do want to commend the staff uh, on this recommendation and others. Their, the staff report and findings made it really easy to look at this and evaluate what the situation was. And, and certainly seeing that, I mean, this house as it currently stands has very little resemblance to the house that was there in the 60s. And yes, sir. But I appreciate the, the engineer report as well as the, the thorough photographs on this one as well as the other ones we've seen today. Thank you. Good job. Okay, is the applicant here? Yes, ma'am, there. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Hi there, my name is Christy Wilson. I'm a neighbor of the owner. I'm the applicant, a neighbor of the owner, and I'm also a real estate broker and owner of a real estate firm in Sylvan Park where this home is located. And I have no argument against the demolition. Um, the goal is 
that this will be sold and a historic looking home will be built there with y'all's um, with your help and guidelines. And I also want to commend Paul. He has been wonderful to work with to help through this process. I w was not familiar with how to go through this process and the entire historic staff has been great. So thanks to that. And I'm happy to, to answer any questions you guys may have about the, um, the owner, the situation or anything, but it's sort of clear. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you for standing in for the owner. Okay. Please, please let her know that. Open public hearing, closed public hearing. Discussion? Madam Chairman, this one seems to be pretty clear cut. Uh, the, oh, this one seems to be pretty clear cut. The evidence shows that the house is, uh, is in bad shape and based on the pricing that was given to them for repairing, it looked to me like it was the cost of rebuilding. So I saw very little bit that could be repaired and I think it would take a total rebuild. Uh, I will second I just, in part of the discussion, I just want to say too that because, you know, we t we take demol demolishing um, homes of this very, um, uh, in what's right, intimately, intensely, you know, we, we don't like doing it, but I think the way this one has been so altered um, and along with condition, um, I, I feel like this is uh, in line with what we would, you know, when we ever do approve a demolition. So anyway, I, I kind of put that out there to make sure it's in the notes. I understand that we don't take this lightly. It's probably a better way to say it. We don't take lightly to making these demolition requests, but uh, in this case, I do feel like it's appropriate as well. So once again, I second the motion. Um, also, in addition, just to just to confirm again, it's a demolition is appropriate if a building or major portion of a building has irrevocably, irrevocably lost its architectural and historical integrity and significance, and its removal will result in a more historically appropriate visual effect on the district. Um, I think that's what we're hearing the commission say. Uh, are there are there comments on that? Okay. With respect to 4709 Elkins Avenue, I move for approval of staff recommendations. It's a motion. I think we've seconded in motion twice, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get take that as a motion. Uh, all right, there's a first and a, and a second, and all in favor? Aye. Okay, are there any opposed? None opposed, and the motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the next item is a request to construct an outbuilding that will include a dwelling unit um, at 2020 10th Avenue South. Uh, the house located at this address uh, contributes to the historic character of the Waverly Belmont Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. It was likely built circa 1880, making it one of the oldest homes in the neighborhood. The commission approved an addition as well as alterations to the historic house in June of this year. Uh, the house, or sorry, the outbuilding meets all of the design guidelines except for overall height, um, which is taller than the historic house and the distance from the house. The minimum distance between uh, a house and outbuilding per the design guidelines is 20 feet. This application shows um, a separation of 17 feet. The proposed dadu is 25 feet tall. The historic house, however, is 18 feet tall from the finished floor uh, and will be uh, a maximum of 20 feet tall from the finished floor with the approved addition. Uh, the maximum height per the design guidelines for an outbuilding is 25 feet or the height of the, the house, whichever is less. Uh, so in order to meet the design guidelines in this case, the, the outbuilding would have to be reduced by at least five feet, which would result in a complete redesign of the project. So for that reason, staff recommends disapproval of the project. Um, but here is the proposed front elevation and the side elevations and the rear. Um, and in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the proposed outbuilding, finding that it does not meet section 3H1C for height and section 3H60 for setbacks of the Waverly Belmont Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay design guidelines. Questions? No? Applicant. Okay. Don't believe they're here. No? Yeah. All right. Uh, open public hearing. Close public hearing. Okay. Discussion? Well, it seems to me that, that the 
staff has presented its case very eloquently, and 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 um, I approve with the, their recommendation. Agreed. So I'll make a motion. Is there any other discussion? Yep. Okay. I'll make a motion to improve the staff recommendation on 2020 10th Avenue South. There's a second, the first and a second, and uh, all in favor of this motion. Aye. Okay, any unopposed? It's unopposed. <laughs> no opposed, it's unopposed. <laughs> the motion carries. Okay, last item under new business is 1102 Bate Avenue, which is an application for infill. Um, this is the site. It's currently the side yard to the house next door at 1104 Bate Avenue. Um, I don't believe the lot was ever developed, although it is a legal lot and has been a legal lot for quite some time. Um, so here's the house next door. Again, the house will be situated, the new infill will be situated to the right of this house. Um, the applicant has designed the new infill to be um, similar in design and form and size to the historic house next door. Um, you know, obviously with some more modern elements. Um, the, um, the infill will meet all base zoning setbacks. And just a spoiler alert, we're recommending approval without any real design um, changes, so I'm just going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, so here are the floor plans and the roof plan. Um, here's the elevation, um, comparing it, the front and, and rear elevations to um, the house next door. It does have quite a tall foundation at the front, um, but there's quite a bit of cross slope um, to this lot. And you can see that the house next door um, that's existing has a fairly tall foundation at the front, and this will be slightly lower than that. Um, this is a situation we've already met with the architect on the site, and um, when things are under construction, you know, they're well aware that they need to do a foundation inspection, and we will um, work with them on the site as well with that, as we typically do, but in a situation like this, it's all the more important. But as drawn, staff finds it to be appropriate. Here are the side elevations. Um, so in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the infill with the following conditions. The foundation and finished floor heights be consistent with the finished floor heights of the adjacent historic houses to be verified by staff in the field. Staff approve of final details, dimensions, and materials of windows and doors. A walkway be added to the front porch to the street. Um, with staff approving the materials for the walkway and stair. Staff approved the roof and masonry color, dimensions and texture, and the location of the HVAC units. With these conditions, staff finds the proposed infill meets section three of the design guidelines for the Waverly Belmont Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Um, the architect who I've been working with um, is in agreement with these conditions. Um, I, he's not here and um, he sends his regrets for not being able to be here. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Melissa, quote for you. Before you go, a quick question about it looks uh, in, from the photographs the house next door. You've got a wood front porch that's elevated, and um, the stairs. Am I reading that right? The stairs are they look recent, relatively recently replaced. I mean, they're last ten years, something like that. And that probably. there's a wood railing that probably is not original to. Uh, yeah, I doubt that any of that in the front is original. Yeah. And um, but it does have you know the way the t stone turns in. You've got concrete stairs up to that stair. It's just a very prominent feature both right. on this house and it right. will be a very prominent feature on the proposed house. Um, is there, behind the hedge, is there a railing on this porch? Let me, you know, I have photos. There are photos in the staff recommendation, which I don't think I included here. Let me see if there's another one. Um, I don't recall. Um, there are photos in the staff recommendation. And, and it appears from the rendering that there will, and a, if they want to get a building, an occupancy permit, there will be a railing on the new house for sure. Um, I, I, those are, and I, I note that the app, that the condition of approval is that the staff approve the stair and, right. and the and those railings. That um, those will be very important details of right. this, and, and certainly their materiality and their construction would would be uh, worth paying a lot of attention to. Sure. I do have a photo. I mean, it's hard. I can pass it around. Um, it's um, not so great because it's in black and white, um, but there is a there is a railing currently on this on the porch. It's a simple wood railing. I'm sure it's not original. Um, Just in light, could you go back to the actual elevation? I think they actually drew 
yeah, there. Yeah. And typically, in situations like this, staff recommends a fairly simple wood railing um, in design, particularly for infill. But even when someone's adding one to a historic house, if we don't know what it would have looked like before, if there hadn't been one before, we typically recommend a fairly simple design. There's, um, even in this drawing and with current lumber, the way that it is, I think um, spanning that spanning the distance, which is a relatively short distance in the house, the, the proposed house, with a single, um, we just I've seen on houses we've approved some pretty shabbily constructed. You know, you turn something on the flat and you stick a bunch of right. verticals and shoot some nails up through it and, you, and you're done and right. it sort of gets this belly in the middle of it that. Um, I don't want to tell you how to do it. I, that, that just is of, of some concern that even sure. an intermediate post there, that, that it be considered and thought of before it's left to carpenters in the field to make sure. that determination for sure. the applicant. Okay. Um, can I open public hearing? Okay, any, any other questions for Melissa? All right, and the applicant's not here, so we're gonna open public hearing and close public hearing and have discussion. With respect to 1102 Bate Avenue, I move for approval of staff recommendation. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, on to design consolidation. Yes, um, you can continue the public hearing from last month, but just to give you a little, to give everyone a little reminder, um, the design guideline consolidation project is three parts. Uh, the first part is to combine all of the neighborhood conservation zoning overlays, which are all already pretty similar, into one document, um, but then have a part two so that any of those guidelines that currently exist that are specific to specific districts will be retained. And then part three is a possible form book for outbuildings. And you can continue the public hearing. So I have a practical question. Um, and how, when an applicant comes to um, the commission, the MHC staff, and how would they um, direct them now that you have consolidation and uh, specific to their district as well? Yes, the process is very much the same. Um, they will just have two places to look. They'll have their district-specific set of design guidelines. Some of those districts don't have any guidelines specific to them. Some of them just have a handful. And so they'll be following both documents. They'll be following that overall coverage with the design guideline consolidation, which is already in their current guidelines. And then they'll be following the design-specific guidelines as well. So there's not like a first and second no. step. These, Correct. These are together. Together. Yes. And will be looked on together. And if it's an outbuilding, it'll be all three parts together. Okay. Are we good with that so far? Okay. All right. Well, um, we'll discuss after public hearing is open. So public hearing is open. Mr. Venick, you're good. All right. I'm good. I'm going to submit my comment. Yes, yeah, and that's duly noted. Mr. Venick has given us his public comment. Um, anyone else? Okay. We're closing public hearing. No, we're not closing public hearing. Excuse me. We're in discussion, right? And, and public hearing will remain open until November. Okay, so more comments to the staff um, is acceptable. And do we have another community meeting? Um, yes, I don't remember the date off the top of my head. The 20th. That sounds right. The next meeting is Monday the um, 16th at the Martin Center in Hillsborough West End at 6 o'clock. Okay. Is there one on the 21st? Yeah. Oh, I'm 
Today's the 16th, the 21st, Monday the 21st. Okay, so October 21st. So there aren't any other community meetings um, scheduled after that? Not yet. Um, okay. there, there could be, but no one has come forward and asked for one. We were asked to attend the Belmont Hillsboro neighborhood mm -hmm. meeting. It's not specific to this project. Um, we were just asked to be there in case there are questions. There's no formal presentation. It's their regular meeting, so there are other topics for them to cover. Continuing on that vein, um, so we've had three community meetings now, right? Um, September, October 7. No, this is probably. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. So we've had two. This this coming one will be the will fourth. Be for, fourth. Okay. Not counting all the community meetings before that. Right. Of stakeholders, et cetera. In community meetings. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is your sense about um, public comments? Well, I, I, we still aren't feeling like, or I personally don't feel like there's any um, one thing that everyone's concerned about or happy about. Um, we're hearing lots of comments, but it's all about, they're all different. <laughs> so we, we're not, we don't have a lot of guidance yet to follow, and so that was one of the hopes today was to at least hear from you on some of the things that we think are the bigger changes. This is not a summary of all of them, um, but it's some of the ones we'd like to hear from you what you think, if, if you don't mind. I've attended two of the community meetings, and it seems that it's more general um, questions that uh, the staff has answered, uh, in, I mean, answered in a way of uh, giving them some more lead on that. So uh, I, too, have not heard whether they're opposed or not opposed or specific concerns. Um, this seems the outbuilding discussion seems to come up the last two times anyway. So um, that might be just something we can discuss more. So, so it seems to me I haven't heard as much discussion about the consolidation of the guidelines except for a, a very few arguments about whether there was any change in those guidelines. But as far as the concept of consolidating and putting it into one document with the supplemental specific conditions for each of the, the zones, uh, the overlays uh, being called out. And, and when I read through that document, it seems to make sense to me the way it's organized and I think it'll be a good tool. Uh, the, the concerns that I've heard are, um, uh, one of them was that, uh, that in essence, I think for the outbuildings, uh, there'd be administrative approval just like we currently have. And that seems to be uh, compatible and, and consistent with what we've been doing. So if the staff deems it to fall within those guidelines, then it doesn't come before the commission. If there are things that are questionable about that or judgment calls, then they come before the commission. That's consistent with what we do with the rest of the overlay documents. Uh, the second one, though, I think is really about the outbuilding forms and the scale of those and the appropriateness in those neighborhoods. And so I think to me, one of the questions I have is how do we resolve that so that we're sure that we're not putting, you know, oversized outbuildings behind, uh, behind existing structures, historic structures. Robin, can you speak to that a bit on is there or isn't there, I mean, we, we read it, but it, it is, you know, expansive. So to just say, are we still maintaining what we've known and discussed and approved all along, or is there a change of how we review that? There isn't a change in the review. The process is the same, as, as you pointed out. But there's definitely changes mm -hmm. throughout the document. Um, and the form book, like we talked about last time, is taking a whole different um, philosophy and look at outbuildings than currently followed. Can, can we pull up the um, form letters in the in the book? Probably part three in there would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a specific question related to commissioners for discussion. Sean, could you pull up the other presentation? And, and part of that to me seems like in the past we've pretty well said the form of the outbuilding will will have reasonable shape, roof slopes, have a relationship to the to the historic building. 
And I think the, the, the form catalog uh, does open up for contemporary structures and other unusual structures behind there, so. You know, and, and I, um, I am maybe more open than others might be to contemporary yeah. designs that are, that are appropriate or at least a pitch for one, uh, not a roof pitch, but a, a pitch from, from an applicant for, for one. And um, a lot of times it's, the judgment of those is, is, is more nuanced than maybe a form book can um, communicate. In, in particular, I'd like to know if the form book would permit the application that was, where the applicant was not present, I forget the address, would the form book permit that, the approval of that specific outbuilding? I mean, that's, and I'm putting you on the spot. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of, if it would, hmm. um, I'm not, is that okay? <laughs> We didn't approve it today. Um, so uh, the other one um, is specifically to some of the forms of, if you have a 900 square foot post-World War II or 1940s home that's small -er, and you put a shed roof F, I think is the letter, on that, it matters the orientation of what matters to whoever's perspective it's viewed from, if you put that towards the house and it may be visible from the street uh, with the tall wall towards the house, that certainly is one thing and viewed from the street m might not, not to pick on shed roof forms, but I, I mean, I think thinking this thing all the way through, we need to be careful what we wish for because we're probably going to get it. And the other thing about a shed roof form is that I, 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 in concept, I, I very much like that someone can approach this and add pieces and parts to it and know without a whole lot of doubt that I can take this, it'll be approved. And, you know, I, don't, I don't even have to go, go through the full, the full waiting to, you know, for the commission to, to do their thing, that it would be approved. But um, I, I'm, I question whether um, if, financial gain is the main motive, a one roof form might become more predominant over the other, just as we've seen, um, which is a function of zoning, our zoning code, but also the one and two family code, which we, you know, is national, we don't have any control over that, that tall skinnies are, it's a language that is not just Nashville, but it's particularly unique to Nashville in that you have a tall skinny residence that if you put parking on the ground floor, there's sort of this leftover nebulous, not big enough to be a bedroom, not desirable to be a bedroom, not really an office, and then, you know, living space on the second floor. That is a, not a criticism of that way of living, but it's certainly different than historically what we've seen. I don't know if it's necessarily better. That's for somebody smarter for me and generations to come to see if people tear those houses down or if they choose to live in them and they're worthy of preservation or keeping. But um, I think I, w I would hate to see that the um, <laughs> that the form book be used in historic neighborhoods, sort of to the detriment of um, of that. That you see this, somebody figures out the shed roof, kind of gives you the maximum. It's easier for me to get the stair up because if I have a gabled form, we've we've seen that argument a lot. The gabled form, the stair has to turn and come up in a certain way, so you don't have a head knocker at the you know, up against the, the far wall if you're in that 20 foot of distance. Um, and if that shed roof then, if the low side is turned towards the house and you're looking at a lot of shingle, but yet the alley and your neighbor across the way is looking at, you know, the full two stories of that shed form, I say two stories and I, and I need to get more familiar. Yeah, I mean, so it's, you know, see, see the full two stories of that. Is that appropriate in any condition or every condition? Um, w w is a question I think worthy of some discussion um, for for us to, to and and even some of the, testing that against even some of the other other forms. Um. The other thing with that is that with um, you know our approval of outbuildings has been that it 
it is not larger than the historic house. So it's kind of in line with what you're kind of saying, maybe, but no, maybe not. Um, uh, but say yeah. it's a one and one and a half story historical house, then probably we're not going to approve a two story outbuilding. I would say generally yes, or certainly generally. we're going to ask the applicant to, to we're going to look at it much more closely to make sure that it doesn't swallow the house in front. And with this, this these new the consolidation, then there's an ability to, to have it larger. Is that right? Taller, certainly. Taller. Taller. Yeah. So that's different than how we've sort of viewed our approvals in the past. So I think we just need to be really aware of that, that it changes a bit. Are we on track on that, Robin? Yeah. We're here to hear from you today. Yeah. But I mean, that's what that's what's being presented is that it, are there changes a bit? Yeah, there's a bit, you know, of changes that we need to be sure we're okay with. Um, you know, I, I, count discussion. I think there, are, there are changes, and in, in terms of not only is it, it definitely is changing it by putting this in place, the undoing of it isn't, we don't just get to say, hey, no, that one, you know, staff, we need you to bring these to us. That ain't how, that ain't how it's gonna work because we're, we're putting this in place and it's in place and, and we would have to go through noticing and uh, to unring the bell would be, you know, we'd have to unring the bell and I don't know how to do that. I mean, I do know how to do that and it's, it's a lot of doing to, to make that happen. It, can I? keep um, a couple of things that we're in discussion about. Um, what do you all think about materials? Can we go, can we go back to the... Oh, you want to go back there? Okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. You have a comment no, too, I think. Okay. I just wanted to add, I, I also have concerns about um, an outbuilding being taller than the main house and that being allowed. Um, and I really appreciate that this is streamlining the process and making it easier for applicants and, and hopefully for staff too. I'm concerned that there are too many different forms that are just pre-approved that may not fit the context of, of the neighborhood. And I am, and I, I mean, I support contemporary architecture and I'm open to con more contemporary forms too, like um, Commissioner Mosley had said, but I'm, I'm concerned that these, I, I, that it's not giving us enough opportunity to review and that it's, it's, it's too many that are pre-approved that may not work with the neighborhood, neighborhoods. I, I think that's, that's where I'm coming down as I go through that. You know, in a lot of ways, we're keeping the 10 and 11 foot eave heights, we're keeping the overall height of the structure. But I do think, especially with the forms that can be 11 feet on one side and 18 feet on the other side behind a one-story house, that's, I think that really can affect the context not only of the primary house but of the neighbors as well. So it, it may be that some, you know, that if some of those forms may need to come to the commission for, you know, staff and commission for interpretation because it would be more subjective than just the formula of yes it fits this book and it checks the box and yes I can do it so you know in, in thinking of um, an 11 foot eave height at the low side you, know, you might jump up to I'm just thinking if you've got the absolute minimum garage with a door that's going to swing up I mean seven having a bearing height at seven six yeah, you know, it, it's nearly darn near impossible. I think it could be done if you really worked hard to get a seven six bearing height. Um, and let's assume you're at nine, you're at eight eight. So you're on the low side. You're maybe what a three foot knee wall. So you, I'm I'm sort of trying to think through why why someone would choose that because that that is my that they would become the choice purely on a financial analysis and if you just see the same thing every time there's no way that you, that you could undo it or, or it would be hard to undo so you you would essentially render about half of the second story unusable by choosing that form would you would you not i mean it's some, somewhere in there i mean to get even at four you don't really want to be 
so you're not knocking your head or creating some usable storage in the in the second floor. You're going to be up to six, eight, seven feet to you know before you get there, and so it kind of re creates this bowling alley of a of an upper upper floor. The gable seems more useful, uh, and even a cross gable seems more useful in terms of. Um, what people desire in an outbuilding and the amount of livable space. Who knows, I mean, we don't review the interior floor plans, so who knows what somebody would, you know, would come up with on the inside or if they had to, you know, create some sort of sloping interior slab or it's crazy, craziness. But I, that one, um, on the one hand, I don't want to overthink it, but but on the other, I, I, an 18 foot, that, that is, that's a two story wall that we, we generally might not allow, and depending on which orientation that would have, would, would certainly have an impact um, towards the house or towards the alley. And I haven't looked in, we need to look at some of the others to see and maybe answer some of the um, questions of appropriateness um, to all the districts as a whole. Um, but that, that one, the shed reform in particular, is, is one that I've just wondered about and, and tried to picture. And, in some of the districts, or as a as a, a counter to, or in in place of many of the applications that we've seen, even even many of the ones today, and their appropriateness for something that we did review, let alone something that we would never see, uh, or likely never see. I'm just interested in hearing what Robin thinks about um, the possibility of these guidelines doing something different than we've done before, like making a roof higher than the, the current house and how that was. Well, we'd really like to hear from you guys today. I, I don't really want to try to convince you one way or the other. Right. We, we want to hear your comments and everyone, continue to gather everyone else's comments and then come back with um, a proposal in November. You know, it seems those projects that come before us want to become larger and larger and you know, if builders or homeowners want to do that for economic reason or, or whatever, I mean, I think we do consider stuff like that, but I mean, projects like that, but um, I just have a hard time, you know, again, going through what I'm just hearing is that I have a hard time saying it's larger than the historical uh, structure, uh, contributing structure. So. Hopefully you've given, we've given you an, enough comments on, on that, okay. Um, can we try to discuss another item, other items on our discussion list maybe perhaps? <laughs> um, what have you, what have you all other commissioners have looked into, uh, you know, the consolidation in adding roof color to the list of items that do not need review would that be do not need review by by the commission or, or by the staff or the commission the proposal is not reviewed at all and these two images with everything we were trying to think of what's the worst case scenario so okay. if you what you've don't, shown on the screen and this is what we came up with someone could go with an all-white roof um, or someone could do that modeled color and Currently, our thinking is that although those two examples aren't the best thing, and maybe not what we'd really want to see, um, s roofing isn't permanent. Um, it's not really changing the style or form of the building. But I mean, it does you know, hopefully last for 20 years or more. Um, so your thoughts on not reviewing roof color? I, if it's typically not an issue, I would leave it in there in case the worst case scenario comes up. Because I'm just thinking like, what if the image on the right just becomes some hot trend? Like hopefully it wouldn't, but we've seen trends that we don't like and that aren't historic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the, the case for the, for the right. And on the left, just thinking about if there's, I mean, and I'm not, saying to go against energy codes, but on commercial buildings, we're putting white roofs on everything because it's better energy-wise. And if that, now I don't know how to say this without sounding like I'm going against like what would be better from an energy standpoint, but that could become a trend for that very reason. 
It's kind of that thing so is if it ain't like if, it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thought it was broke <laughs> because there are no, there is no guidance for reviewing color. So we're told to review it, but there's no guidance on what we're reviewing, what is an appropriate color. Historically, there were quite a number of uh, different colors available in asphalt shingle. Um, so, and since for my 10 years, no one has presented something we felt uncomfortable with that maybe this was an opportunity to give a little on the details and then tighten up on some of the bigger issues like the form and massing and, and reforms. Would, um, I'm thinking of, you know, we don't, we don't see that many metal roofs, um, but I, I'm, in that there's no guidance on color, like what do you say no to and how, how would, Ms. Jones and the staff at Metro Legal defend that. Uh, if it were arbitrary, then it would be just that. It'd be arbi arbitrary and it would be hard to defend, uh, harder to defend. I, I think um, I go to sort of the stone and masonry. Um, I, I would tend lean, lean more towards stone and, and masonry in terms of um, buildings. Uh, at least we'd hope that buildings were of the time and the place where they're constructed. I, I think that there's a little bit um, the reason why we're here, why we exist. And so, you know, if you've got a um, sandstone, well, sandstone e e exists, and there are historic examples of sandstone being used as a foundation material in Nashville. But, it, you know, if you've got a certain tone um, of a simulated stone, which is just not, a, you know, it, it's not appropriate in the color scheme of things that are appearing naturally, we would we have to take an objection, and I think the guidelines give us some ability to take objection to that. And um, with in preservation areas, I, I think certainly red is mentioned as that's what the color that brick ought to be. And there are lots of other options that are offered for for brick colors and available and, and finishes that are simulated whitewashing and, and pressing things into it to make it look old that um, I would say maybe more appropriate or, or more ubiquitous out, not, not in historic districts, but in suburbs and, and further flung neighborhoods. So I, I would tend to make that more the litmus test on roofs, but you bring up a good point, like when have we seen a roof that was objectionable? Um, well, does Secretary of the Interiors have any specifics? Because you're, and so here, that's part of my comment as well, that y you're saying we don't have any guidance. So do you want guidance on a roof color or is it because you don't want to do it? I'm, I'm a little uh, like, you want guidance or you don't want guidance or because you don't want guidance, we're just gonna not have to approve it. Well, it depends on what you want. Um, we but, could not review it or we could review it, in which case we would need to add some guidance. Right. Or we would recommend that you add guidance if you want to keep reviewing it. Um, and I will point out too, that keep in mind you don't review replacement roofing. So all of that can be anything. You're not reviewing that now. So we're really only talking about roofing for um, infill or additions. Um, and to the energy efficiency and the architects, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but in recent years I've heard that some of the darker colors have enough reflectivity to them that they're almost as good as a white roof. Is that true? Yeah, it, 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 um, it depends on what zone you're in because there's a, a point where like actually a darker roof is, helps you more than a lighter colored roof depending on how north or far north or south you are. But I would, and that was just using that as a you never know what's coming. I'm just trying to figure out what guideline would look like. If you wanted to say, is it a color, you know, if it's color, is it because it's near the historical house? Does it need to match up? Is it similar? I mean, that seems a little ambiguous. Council may be able to give us some guidance there because I think there's case law about mandating colors or in terms of paint colors, I, I would think that maybe one of the reasons why we we don't do that on certain items. Mr. Mosley, I will have to research that. <laughs> 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 oh, 
Um, Sorry. No, <laughs> that's okay. And I don't mind doing that at all. And I'll be happy to do that. We have one more meeting that we'll be discussing that. So I'll note that and I'll research as to whether or not um, that has been found to be arbitrary. I was kind of racking my brain as I was, th as you all were talking about um, whether I could think of anything offhand. What I can say, and I was going to just kind of chime in on your comment, um, we do have to be careful about being arbitrary as it relates to making decisions that come before the board. Um, I do think you do have um, a good bit of uh, freedom to adopt guidelines that you think are appropriate. And I don't know that you would start with a particular color, but it may be something that you could say um, not contrasting greatly with you know, the colors that are pre prevalent in the area or worded in such a way that you're not just picking, you know, you can't have a pink roof or you can't have, you know, there's a way to perhaps craft it so that it is not cost contrasting greatly with, with uh, typical colors that are seen in the historic area or something like that, um, that perhaps will help us stay out of kind of that arbitrary um, and capricious area. Um, I do think it might be helpful for the board to know what the code says specifically or just kind of have a little bit of a refresher with regard to adopting guidelines. So I'm just going to share some thoughts with you from Section uh, 1740, Section B, Establishment of Design Review Guidelines. The Historic Zone, Zoning Commission shall adopt design guidelines for each historic overlay district and apply those guidelines when considering preservation permit applications. Design guidelines related to the construction, alteration, addition, and repair to, and relocation and demolition of structures and other improvements shall be consistent with the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 as amended. A public hearing shall follow the applicable public notice requirements of Title 15 of this chapter, and it shall precede the adoption of all design review guidelines by the Historic Zoning Commission. Testimony and evidence material to the type of historic overlay under consideration may be considered by the commission in its de uh, deliberations. So that's the, the guidance that you have from the, code, from the code with regard to how to adopt them. Um, it doesn't go into detail about it, but just kind of gives you the general overview and the kind of the general theme about the, the guidelines being consistent with the uh, National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And as it relates to the different things that you would consider, construction, alteration, addition, repair to relocation and demolition. Um, so those are the things to, to consider. So I hope those thoughts are, are somewhat guiding thoughts as you think through this, and I'll be happy, Mr. Mosley, to research to see if we can find any case law that specifically addresses the issue of colors of roofs. And I don't, I don't know that that needs to be extensive. <laughs> I, I think you've given us a solution by, the, you know, we, we, we do the forms by not contrasting greatly, it, it, just so long as we don't, there's a certain color of orange that, you know, might be more popular here than it would be in another state mm -hmm. um, or whatever else. <laughs> that that, that we, we can't, being that arbitrary is, is a hard place to, one, act from and, and certainly to enforce. I'll add to that, the, one of the reasons we, or the main reason that I'm aware of that we don't review paint color is because it's not a permanent alteration to the building. And of course, as you pointed out, fads change over time. And so it just wasn't a concern. Uh, a lot of different commissions across the country don't review paint color, but some do. How, how about that for roofing? How about the other design guidelines across the country? It, it just depends. Some do, some don't. Um, most cities don't have a conservation zoning overlay like we do. Most of them are more traditional historic preservation, and they're much stricter. So, so one of the things that I was interested in, in looking for, and, and it may be there, but I haven't seen anything about it, but in the past, one of the things we've struggled with on the outbuildings has been um, greatly sloping properties and different forms of properties. And I, I particularly remember one that was really difficult where, uh, although it was a one and a half story house, it had very tall ceilings up on sort of a hill. The, the slot, the lot sloped steeply back to the back, dropped off a lot. And we were still requiring them to keep an 11 foot eave height on the, on the outbuilding. And I know that's that's been yeah. uh, that's been uh, difficult for me to resolve, but but the guidelines called for that, so we really had no choice as far as as enforcing that. Was there any discussion about you know taking into account the site and the sloping and 
how that works. Yes, the current draft looks at measuring from the highest grade within the footprint of the outbuilding. So at any point when that grade drops, obviously the wall height's gonna get taller. So those eave heights are measured from that tallest point. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to, rather than take into account whether the grade rises or, or drops, uh, looking at it, at it proportionally. Mm -hmm. So we're measuring from finished floor on the historic building and grade on the outbuilding, because usually it doesn't have a foundation, just a slab. But I think on, on some of those, like the one I was thinking about, you know, the house had a great presence. It had a large footprint. It had very high ceilings, high eave heights, and, and we were still requiring, even though it was mm -hmm. sort of down the hill, that that eave height, you know, because the, the grade did go down, but, but these guidelines were the measure from the grade at the outbuilding, right? They don't take into account the entire site to the No, they don't take into account the entire site. No. Okay. And I think to maybe further that argument or look at it from a couple different directions. One, I, I feel like any applicant, whether it's viewed amongst the staff or meets the letter of, of what's written, um, is free and often does provide, you know, make application for something that is is um, might in some way be different than, than what's written in the guidelines and they would still be free to do that. Um, I think the other thing that would be, you know, this gets into a very specific situation, but if you have a steeply downsloping lot that's entered from the alley side, and we've seen one of these that I can recall, and you measure from up at the alley, and there's enough, you know, existing grade, you know, maybe 10 places in, in, in our districts where this would happen, but you suddenly, you know, you get beyond, does there need to be an upper limit of, you know, this one, this one really just, this one deserves a further review and you just happen to be in the, in the, in the scenario or, or, or place where if you get greater than X amount or two stories or 24 feet or, or something, is, is there a necessity to put um, um, a cap on, on something that would be egregious, even though it fits with it? And I'm going, I may be going back to the form document that coupled with the, you know, with, with the, what's written as, as the maximums, is there a, are we taking that into account to, to avoid some, an undesirable, very undesirable result that um, would just by, by right be approved uh, without coming before us or, or without the staff having the opportunity to, to disagree because it's written in a guideline and use both their good judgment and our hopefully good judgment at, at the end of the day on, on some of those cases. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining scenarios or outcomes that are probably pretty, pretty unlikely, but I, I can think of one that if it were measured, you got to pick some way to measure. I mean, you just have to. But if it were measured in that way, it, it might not. It might not. We might not see it. Um, and and I need to dig a little bit deeper. I had I had not thought of that scenario or, or how that was measured. That we could um, try to test test the guidelines a bit against something like that. And if there were a simple text addition that we could say, as long as it's not greater than or less than something like this, that that it would parenthetically we could put a little bit more restriction on it whether that would even be necessary or appropriate. What do you think about, no, no, no. any more? What do you think about siding review? Did you all read that? Yeah, well, I'm just starting off with that. <laughs> I think um, I, I um, concur. Um, about siding review um, because, again, I think I have seen some structures that have totally um, gutted a historical building, um, but that siding is considered a primary cladding and that it could weaken a structural integrity. So looking at that, um, and adding that, I mean, as in the consolidation seems to be reasonable um, any thoughts on that, commissioners? Yeah, I was really pleased to see this added. I couldn't believe that 
siding wasn't, uh, the removal of siding wasn't uh, reviewed previously, so that's all good in my book. Because I've seen buildings in my neighborhood where the siding was replaced with uh, what we would not approve with uh, textured or patterned siding. That, you know, it's not a huge deal, but I, it would have been better to be just f flat like we normally, um, or what you see historically. Um, so yeah, that, that's a great change. In um, reviewing siding, we've often heard, and I think it's a legitimate argument, um, in previous construction technique, the quality of the siding, the fact that it was wood, um, and in, in the construction technique, the siding itself was, um, if you had some diagonal bracing, we just don't construct that way anymore, but if there was some diagonal bracing in, in the studs that um, the siding acted both as sheathing and as exterior material. And oftentimes that doesn't make, with today's building code and just today's construction technique, that doesn't make for quite a very tight building. And as that wood deteriorates over time, you're introducing into what previously was an uninsulated envelope. Now we don't we don't build a house without insulation in it and fiberglass. It'll hold water for a long, long time. If it if the conditions are right, it won't necessarily rot or mold in and of itself, but it will maintain moisture in it. And oftentimes you hear the argument if somebody is doing a significant rehab of a home is that you'll they'll remove the siding to put up sheathing and then reside the house and that obviously changes significantly how window trims meet windows and, and I mean, it can vary, that can and will vary drastically a change if it's not done carefully and without some review and oversight um, could, would very drastically change um, the appearance of lots of elements on the house. Um, not, you know, the end result would be a much more energy efficient house and, and, and one that could potentially last much longer than if it had no sheathing um, and were not rehabbed. So I, I, that's another vote for siding review and the process that, you know, all the things that are hidden behind the siding, how that's going to happen and, and um, what's going to take place that the staff would have some purview and, and ability to inspect if, if, in fact, that were to be approved and a full removal of siding and replacement. I think we skipped one, which was siding reveal. You want to go there? <laughs> what about the reveals? Any comments on reveals? I think that's. I agreed with the staffs, or, or not, with, but with the. I guess where you're headed with that, that historically there were different reveal widths and that to allow others besides five inches seems appropriate. I just don't know if there's a, are you putting any limit, would you put any limitations on it? Like maximums or minimums? The current draft doesn't have that, but I mean, certainly had it. Would there, be, would there be a danger of somebody trying to be a cheapskate and just buy as little siding as possible and have 10 inch reveal so they just don't have to buy as much? Could you put it? Maybe putting a maximum, or, or again, uh, language by not contrasting greatly. by not contrasting greatly language, something like that. I don't know. That that one's a little tough. <laughs> um, when siding has all different kinds of reveal in historic districts, what's not contrasting greatly? So we'd love to hear if you have any ideas of what the maximum should be, or um, if we should review it. And there's a range given. I, you know, I mean, again, I, I'm not trying to convince you of any one thing. We'd love to hear from you what your thoughts are. My, I'll, there's, um, I think there's a couple, couple things to this argument, or at least the analysis of this. I, I feel like part of, um, historically part of what you, what you saw created, and the reveals created, um, it was a limitation of, what was readily available and cost effective in a in a time when wood was more plentiful than it is now and less expensive than replacement materials and and um, it grew on 
it grew longer and lasted longer, therefore. So uh, now with the types of siding that I think would be put on a house, primarily cementitious siding or some future product, it would be to have um, a row of infill that were a more of a commodity-driven house and, and, and something that was built purely at kind of a market rate for consumption, you, I wouldn't think you would get a variation from one to the next as you see. If you view um, districts as a whole, you, you know, there's a, a common thread that's probably somewhere between, you don't get a lot of them that are two and three, those are unique where they, they use a very really narrow for effect, a very narrow reveal, you get a lot in the four to six range. Um, you know, when you start getting house after house that are seven or eight inch reveals, um, I, it just speaks to a different aesthetic. Um, I, I'm not sure it matters a ton, but uh, it's noticeable when, when you start to, um, at least it's noticeable to me if you drive through through and around communities where it's not regulated, you, you, I think it's pretty common that there's um, the majority of siding sold is probably in the, it's offered in most commonly, I think, in a nine inch. And, you, and when they put it up, they want two inches of coverage um, between one and the next. So, you know, seven sort of, that's the number. That's what you would typically see unless you ordered 11 or the next step up and then you know you just start to get these reveals where the proportion between the top of the foundation and the bottom of the sill and then the height of the windows the siding gets elongated and then all the windows just for price reasons are sort of they're just squat and the combination of those things together and the thinning of the trim and the lack of decoration around the windows it's just more commonly what you see built today. Not every house, but most most commodity-driven houses that way. And, and I, I would hate to um, move further in that direction by just letting it be, eh, we're gonna get seven if, if we don't say less than, than, than something. I, I think this, there may be um, maybe some additional information we could glean from what, what the most common siding is that's sold today and, and not, you know, just not pick some off, off the wall dimension that we're unlikely to get anyways. Because um, I, I, I do know the way, at least for today, and the way siding is installed, there, there probably is a couple of magic numbers in there. It's either going to be X or Y. And then if, you know, if something were, I doubt somebody's going to go out and buy the two inch soffit panels and throw those up and like have a, you know, a one foot 10 inch reveal, but they could if we didn't, if we didn't say they couldn't um, potentially. So I, that's where the by not contrasting greatly, I think that would be greatly, uh, it's unlikely to happen because it just would walk in and it looks terrible. But um, my, my, um, I think there needs to be a maximum. Uh, do, do we, do we just state, I don't think it, it, it's a little different. Do the guidelines say it just, it can't be greater than five, right? And, and if I might chime in, it's fine for the board to establish maximums and minimums and establish uh, numerical values to do, those, um, those items as you look um, to establish some guidelines. Um, as long as there's kind of a rational basis for that adoption. Um, that, and I think that that can be uh, gleaned from the comments that Mr. Mosley made about, um, you know, what, what are the typical sizes that they come in and we don't want anything that's going to be um, too different than what we would like to see in the area. And so I think as long as you have those kinds of statements in the record to support that you didn't just pull a number out the sky, um, that you thought about it, that you consider what the industry standards are and things like that, and that's how you arrived at that, then I think that that's the kind of thing that the court would want to see in the record uh, reflected in your discussion as you choose numeric values for various um, aspects of the guidelines. Have uh, any of the stakeholders in the community meetings had any comment about lap siding reveal? 
Not overwhelmingly so. Some were fine with not reviewing it. Some wanted it reviewed. Um, Council Member Allen would definitely like for there at least to be a wider reveal option. Um, she's asked for that for several years, but there hasn't been an overwhelming response one way or the other. But that reminded me of something I meant to say earlier. All the notes from all of those meetings is, are also on the website. You know, it really is a double-edged sword because you you don't want to have the um, materials of less character that you know you know a lot of times the wider ones look more like vinyl siding. I know we can't put vinyl siding, but that's sort of the look you get. But but by the same token, you did have in the 30s and 40s those beautiful uh, cypress homes with the wide boards with mitered corners, you know, which is a style that you do see around here, yeah. and and so. You know that that has a, a real architectural impact and contributes to the historical character of the neighborhoods. But you, you can't, I guess, you can't solve everything in guidelines. So, so is is it um, helpful to the staff? Uh, you know, and I've seen this in in our guidelines. You know, where we make a statement, or, or perhaps this is italicized. You know, generally it's between X and Y. If the applicant if there's a compelling reason or within the district there's examples or this or that, you know, is, is that, if we do something that's not what we currently do, is, is that a, um, does that get a little more breadth but certainly doesn't open it wide open where it's not reviewed and eliminated altogether? We, we would, I think we would need to be considerate in, in, in perhaps in that, those terms rather than try to rewrite it or invent something that is wholly our own. Um, we may, if we review, um, if we decide to continue to make lab siding reveal a part of the guidelines, we, we probably ought to consider any changes that provide some guidance um, to assist the staff in making that review and assist ourselves when we're looking at the individual or unique case that, you know, may or may not be appropriate. If, if, Something's used as an accent, and it has a wide reveal or a very narrow reveal. Is that is that appropriate? Um, yeah, certainly, you know, I could see think of a scenario where it could be. But if it were the predominant, contrasting greatly sort of side of things, we it might not be something we just want to let pass without review. Just a little reminder on this next one. Um, this image is in all of the neighborhood conservation zoning overlays, and it's often been seen as showing where an addition can be and only can be. But that's not what it was meant to do. It was meant to simply show where an addition could be and that wouldn't have to be reviewed. But of course, as you know, well know in the last few years, you don't see additions this small anymore. Um, we have maybe one or two a year. By the time we do the work to figure out if it's really visible or not, uh, we could just go ahead and issue the permit. So our recommendation is to, current recommendation is to remove the image and instead add a list. This is just a piece of that list of all of the actions that would not require review. Yeah, that, that one's fine with me, it makes sense. The next one is similar in that your clear, uh, the current uh, draft is clarifying what is reviewed. There's language that sounds like you don't review what can't be seen from the street, and there's language that sounds like you do review what can't be seen from the street, but you may weigh it differently. And the policy has been, since the establishment of the first one, I think in 1985, is that you do review the entire project, but you're just more lenient on what cannot be seen. So we're recommending some language that um, just explains all of that better. I vote yes on that one. I said I vote yes on that one. <laughs> Uh, 
I do think, and it may be in a different place, but, but one of the things we really do look at the fronts that are street facing is sacrosanct. And, and as a commission and as staff, we have been much more um, open-minded in the treatment of the side elevations. And especially in the case of longer structures, the back half of those longer structures. So, so I think that at some point, there does need to be the clear message that yes, the front of the building is of prime importance and, and that, will be reviewed most stringently. And that language is in there now right. and we're not proposing removing right. it. Right. Good. This one is, is tightening up height of additions. Um, you've seen them get taller and taller and taller, and we're concerned with how that meets the Secretary of Interior standards. So the recommendation is that the language would say that additions really shouldn't be more than two feet taller than the historic building. That would take into account a ridge raise if somebody wanted to use it. Um, and again, this is to better fit the Secretary of Interior standards. And we have approved some projects like that. This one as well. Mm -hmm. Will that still take into account if there's a, a slope or, or site issues? Is it still just two feet or? Yeah, it's again, because this is a good example of that where the grade rises, uh, but there's still an attempt to get two stories on the back of this, what's truly a one-story house. Um, so that's not to say that people cannot continue to come to you as they do now with, you know, unique situations. But for the most part, if approved, the guidelines would uh, really help people understand that two feet taller is enough. Yeah, I think we see that so often that comes before us. I think the additional clarification is... Good. Is it written in a way where it's two feet above the existing roof height elevation? So people aren't comparing like the height of my house is this and the height of my addition is that, but it's on a slope, but it's written in a way that's very clear that it's measured from the elevation, not comparing heights, I guess. It, it, it is comparing heights, um, but it's making sure that it's not taller than that ridge. So whatever that grade may be. Now, obviously, there's going to be situations where the grade is so tall, you can't even get a one story without the addition being more than two feet tall. And of course, I'm sure you would approve that in that case. This is just most scenarios. So it's, sorry, I, I probably misunderstood the question. The next one is um, continuing along a similar vein about additions. Um, this is to ensure that ridge raises are not also combined with large additions or side additions or rooftop patios. When this was developed back um, before my time, the idea was to allow someone to get some upper level, more usable space in the upper level because it's cheaper to finish out the attic than it is to put down new foundation for a rear addition. So this was a way to get people more usable space without spending a whole lot of money. At that time, people weren't doing huge additions or side additions and rooftop patios. And so this wasn't considered. So the current language, the current draft is staying that if you use a, a ridge race, you can't also create a huge addition. So the addition shouldn't more, be more than 50% of the existing house. So it's kind of trying to, all these different tools were created, they weren't really meant to all be used on one edition. Sorry. On the notes, um, you would say you would recommend text that would not allow a ridge raid raise if, and it lists several bullet points. One of those is that there is also a planned rear addition that more than doubles the existing footprint. But we don't allow that, correct? Just conditionally. 
That, so, may, that may be a typo. The, the current draft says that the addition shouldn't be more than 50% of the footprint of the, so I apologize for that, than the historic building. So right now, you would allow an addition that doubles the size of the house. So what we're saying is if it, if it doubles the size of the house, it shouldn't also include a ridge raise. That addition should get smaller. So sorry for the confusion on that. So then hypothetically, I'm just making sure I've got this. If you have a thousand square foot house with a ridge raise, you could put on a 250 square foot addition with the ridge raise. If you don't need a ridge raise, it could be bigger, but right. I'll just keep going, but we can always come back to any of these. Um, this one is also clarifying something that you have done for years. Um, but it's ensuring that the form of the new construction is appropriate for the building types that are in the district. So do, no matter what the zoning is. So if you have a lot, let's say there was a vacant lot on this block right here. There isn't, but let's say there was. These are all zoned commercially. Um, this would ensure that infill would follow this residential building type, even though it might still have a, res, a commercial use. I think, you know, I don't know if it's valid, but this would be particularly helpful on Music Row. Yeah. You know, I wonder on that if there's a different word than types. Um, in the building industry, the type really refers to the construction materials and assembly, and then and you can commercial building type, residential building type. I think the the word later on is exactly what we're looking for, which is form. That the form be compatible, irrespective of what the construction type is or that kind of thing. So, that, yeah. I was wondering, um, the reason we use type here is because we use form in a different way throughout the rest of the guidelines. Okay. Would it, but, is the distinction we're talking about here, um, you know, we, we often say base zoning is just that. We're, we're applied over the top of a base zoning as, as, a, as an overlay district. You know, in the same way that commercial zoning was applied to something that was, or in a similar way that commercial zoning later was applied to what was once a residence. It's, it's sort of the inverse of, of oftentimes what, what we do. And, and so you, you don't want to take that and then turn it on its head once again and say that, you know, do a commercial infill in a, a row of, you got two historic homes, commercial infill, you know, with a flat roof and that, that, that whole form is, is talking about building use is not, more say that, you know, building, Building use is, is not necessarily um, taken as a, as a reason to uh, permit a form that's incompatible with adjacent forms. In other words, base zoning doesn't grant you or excuse you from fitting in. It's maybe a layman's way of putting it. And we may have already discussed this one. I think this was the last one. Yeah, this was the last one. So again, uh, th these were just some of our ideas of what to cover. This is not a summary. This is not all of the changes. We, we are thrilled to hear from you about anything else you want to talk about, um, any of these options. Uh, you can continue to throw out your ideas via email as well. We'll collect those and add them to the public comment. No, right. this is great. Thank you all so much for yeah. all your work on yes, this. Yes, absolutely, staff. Thank you so much. It's a lot of work. And for 
community meetings as well and input by the public. Um, do you think it's been a good process? I do. I think it has. I mean, there's been quite a number of meetings, stakeholders, community meetings, um, online discussion board. Again, there's a wealth of information on the website. All of the meeting notes are there, who attended, a summary of what was discussed. Um, all the drafts are on there. Links to the discussion boards are on there. Mm -hmm. Research, it, I think there's a good bit of information there too. I just want to say that I wish that all changes in metro government were analyzed so thoroughly with so much community input and um, and for one I, I, I applaud you for that. Thank you. So in November uh, we would be in the position then to vote yay or nay. Yay or nay or defer again. That's correct. You could you could vote yay or nay, or you could continue discussion and defer again if you felt like you wanted to get additional public input or provide additional time for persons to be heard at the public hearing. It's it's your your um, ultimate decision as to how you want to proceed. We just thought it would be a good idea to keep the public hearing open over at least a three meeting period to give people ample amount of time to come in and make comments, um, given the breadth of the, the changes that are being contemplated. Very well. Okay, anyone else? Any other comments? So, so one of the things I'd recommend is that each of us spend a good deal of time with this, and a lot of us have already, but to spend a good deal of time, and come up and write down what we think the changes should be, and, and, and specifically thinking about that. And you know, we've talked quite a bit about the shed roof with the 18-foot high wall, and, and I, I think it, it makes it best if we all come back with a recommendation of what we think that ought to be. You know, I, I agree, and, and it's so expansive, and it is a breadth of, you know, breadth of a lot of information. I wonder if we, I don't know if we assign, I'm just saying that if you take a section that you would really dig in, and if there's any comments, I mean, what do you think about that? The only problem I have with that is that there are some people who have more technical expertise right. than others. Yeah. And so I would I would rather have a thorough review okay. of it by everyone. Okay. All right. Well I'll just threw that out. So we have an assignment this this month and, and again if we we sense that we still need to have more time, um, I feel I need more time about the outbuilding. Um, and just have, you know, some more questions for staff and possibly, you know, have those kind of discussions in depth. So, um, but pretty much the general is um, good flow. Um, and just knowing that it is, um, it goes hand in hand with the district um, guidelines. Um, when you look at that together, um, I think that's very helpful. Uh, hopefully we'll clarify more for the public on that. You, you know, you all do have, um, I, I hear your, your point, um, Commissioner Mayhall, about getting the expertise of everyone so that everyone look at the entire document. But you can, you do have the ability if you wanted to, to break it down into digestible pieces that you will cover at certain meetings if that helps you. So say for instance, if you say all of the commissioners, if everyone could review up through this section and we'll discuss that and then the next meeting up through this section and then that way everybody does have an opportunity to weigh in on the specifics to the extent that the board is interested in doing that that might be something that you might consider as you determine whether or not you're ready to vote at the next meeting or want to continue for additional time i think that's well said because again i, I think myself i have you know a lot to digest about it and if we chewed on it a little bit less and less where we can understand it and go oh yeah I really understand it then um, because we're making a decision for uh, a long haul and I think we, we do take that seriously but we've also been asked to do that and you know public's going to say did you really look at everything I heard somebody say that please look at it I mean it's like well <laughs> 
you know, we're going to do the best we can, but so what do you what do you think about that? You think we should say section sections or what? You still want? I mean, we're still going to look at everything, but. Yeah, I, I, don't, I certainly don't object to that um, as, a, as a suggestion. I, I think should we tackle the, for November, should we tackle the hardest part first, which would be the, um, the outbuildings? And then if there's, if at that point we feel like we've not focused enough on some of the other things and um, there's not, there's some still discussion needed on the remainder or if we need to break up the other other sections, we can determine that at the next meeting or, or come to a vote. Can, can we vote on sections or does it have to be voted all in one? That's a very good question. May I give you an answer at the next meeting? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I would suspect it would be all in one, just um, because you may have language that cross references each other. Or I'm something leaning like that. toward that as a because it's a cumulative document. I'm leaning toward that, but I don't want to opine just yet. But, okay. but I'm leaning. I I agree. I tend to agree with you, but I just want I want to make sure I think yeah. it through. I think well, because I sense that you know one and two might be good to go. And the reason and, and the three, reason. I mean, I think legally, as I think through it, I think legally you probably could do it either way from a legal standpoint. And, and the reason I'm thinking of it that way is because I think about how the general plan is adopted by planning. And you have an overall document um, when Nashville Next comes through or came through. It's adopted as, a, as an overall document. However, as you, um, as there is a need to update different sections of the general plan, then those are brought and voted on in separate sections. So I think you could do that. Um, I just need to think it through as to, you know, from a legal standpoint and think through where we have done something similar. Um, I, I think as long as we go through the process and it's clear on what the, vo the board would be voting on on that day or whatnot, we may need to think through some of those, those logistics of it. It may be easier and more practical to vote at one time on the uh, um, on the entire document, though. Um, and 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 so I just need to I just need to think that through think through kind of the pros and cons and any legal challenges that you might face um, either way. Council, would you also look into whether or not maybe it's possible to review pieces, but to say it will not be active until the entire document? is approved, maybe that? Right, right. So almost kind of like a grant and delay where you um, you might approve the section, but you wouldn't make it effective until effective. a later date, and maybe the whole thing becomes effective at once. That might be a way to do it. And I knew that there, there had to be more than just kind of what I was thinking about then, and that's kind of what I was thinking maybe we could have some conversations in between time, and I can get back to you on it with uh, a little bit um, greater and better guidance on on how that might look, or, some, or at least some options for you to consider, and then you can decide what you think is the best way to approach it. Very good. Good discussion. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, staff. Thank you, public. Before you close the, the meeting, I would like to give an update. We did have the Realtor course, Historic Preservation 101 for Nashville Realtors, and thank you to Hastings for the location, which was Beautiful. Um, uh, also, our guest speakers, David Payne, who's a local realtor and used to be on our staff a few years ago, and uh, Dick Toon with Historic Nashville was there, and Kirsten Vassilar was there to talk about tax credits. So that was a huge help. They all donated their time. Hastings donated the location. So the fees that were collected by the Metro Historical Commission Foundation, uh, almost all of that went into... Um, to their pockets so that they can continue to pay for projects that benefit the entire city like um, Nashville sites and National Register nominations. So it was kind of a, a double win. We had about 27 uh, realtors there and got some great reviews at the end and 
we'll be doing it again probably in a year or two. Robin, just interesting that you mentioned Nashville sites. Can you just um, give us a little over, I know that's kind of a big project that the MHC is doing right now. So. It, yes, and I'm, I'm limited in what I can say because I have not been involved. Uh, but the concept is our tours, different thematic historic tours that you can pull up on your phone. So you can walk around and see historic sites and listen or read about the history of those sites and little short blurbs. So it's easy walks, usually maybe two hours at most. Um, and again, there's different themes. Right now, they're all focused downtown, but there's a lot more coming as well. So they have been raising money to continue that project. I know that we at the district have had some presentations on it, and we're very excited about it. I think yeah. it's going to be great. Yeah, we've did some staff has tested some of them, um, and they're they're really good. It also, if I'm not mistaken, but it launches in November. I believe so. Correct. I think it's November 8th is when it launches, I believe. <laughs> if if one of the commissioners wanted to test, maybe we should contact the office and see if that's possible. I'll check with the staff who are working on that. I think the testing period is over, but I'll, I'll double check. Okay. I uh, think, shall we vote to adjourn? <laughs> is there, <laughs> so moved. All right. We are adjourned. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.